Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this event to celebrate Virtual Reality Day. My name is Keith Webster. I'm the Helen and Henry Posner Jr. Dean of University Libraries at Carnegie Mellon. Delighted to welcome you to this event. Virtual Reality Day is now in its fifth year. Technically, the day is tomorrow, but we are celebrating today. The, the Virtual Reality Day represents a series of voluntary grassroots efforts to help professionals and enthusiasts bring focus to this exciting and emerging field. Typically, events are held during the third week of November, and we really are excited to participate this year in VR Day. Carnegie Mellon is an innovator in virtual and augmented realities, both as a platform for collaboration, utilizing virtual reality studies and tools within disciplines and colleges across the campus. But in Hunt Library, we are proud also to host the ID8 program. ID8 stands for Integrative Design, Arts and Technology, where we seek to connect disciplines through a merging of technology and arts expertise. And virtual and augmented reality are playing a significant role in our programs and in our minors in fields such as game and media design, intelligent environments and sonic arts. Because the University Libraries serves as a center of activity for these diverse fields of study, we are excited to participate in these festivities. And this panel discussion serves as our inaugural Virtual Reality Day event. Before I introduce the participants, I'd like to just spend a couple of moments thanking those who made this possible. Andy Prisbilla, who has brought the whole event together and Jill Chisnell, senior librarian and liaison to our schools of art, arch architecture and design. And as always, our colleagues, Katie Morris and Ryan Freitag in university events and alumni and constituent engagement. They are tremendous partners and we are grateful for their support. The panelists you'll be spending time with in the next hour are uh, three of my colleagues from Carnegie Mellon University, Emma Slayton, Data Curation, Visualization and GIS Specialist in the University Libraries, who will serve as host and moderator. Uh, Ralph Vituccio, a professor in the Entertainment Technology Centre, who has produced and or created several virtual reality and interactive documentary programmes. He is an award-winning and internationally recognised filmmaker and Kristen Carland, Professor of Architecture, Information Systems and Public Policy, both in Heinz College and in the School of Architecture. And Kristen's research focuses on interdisciplinary collaborations in health, the built environment, spatial analysis and data visualization. And our featured panelist and special guest today is Rodney Asher, filmmaker, whose latest work is A Glitch in the Matrix. Rodney is known for exploring the subjective experience in his films through found footage, collage, lost media, and other remix culture activities. The panel discussion will focus on A Glitch in the Matrix, which remixes cult cultural artifacts like movies and music with design, animation, and video game design to explore simulation theory through a multitude of styles. Rodney's film looks at the very nature of reality itself and dares to ask the questions, is the world we live in truly real? Does reality even exist or are we simply avatars in someone else's game? So with that, I am going to wish you all a very pleasant event. I believe I'm going to be booted out into the audience. I look forward to enjoying the event. And I'm going to turn over now to Emma Slayton who will moderate and lead the discussion. So over to you, Emma. Thank you, Keith. And thank you for your wonderful introduction. Um, you've covered a lot of what I wanted to discuss about how exciting it is for us at CMU to be having a virtual reality day where we can put focus on a, the interesting work that's happening around our campus, both in our classrooms, through several dedicated courses, in the various departments that Keith has already mentioned, but also in the interest of our students to engage with programs like open office hours for VR at the university libraries and through engaging with content such as this. 
Um, I'm going to invite uh, Rodney Asher to also now join me. And first off, thank you for making such a wonderful film that made me completely question my own reality <laughs> called The Glitch in the Matrix. And I do have a couple questions for you uh, now, but I would also like to invite members from the audience as we go through the process of our conversation, both with Rodney and later with Ralph and Kristen as well, to start thinking about adding questions into the Q&A box in your Zoom so we can also hear from you your thoughts as well. Um, so Rodney, I'd like to begin with the first question that I had when I watched your wonderful film was thinking through how many of your interviews were actually done through Zoom and how those processes of conversing with someone through a virtual space um, aided the conversation around simulation theory. I want to start there. Well, sure. Um, and, you know, thanks, Emma. Great to talk to you. And I'm, you know, thrilled to be invited here. Um, yeah, most all the interviews that we did in this film, they were actually done on Skype, right? Um, we were doing them, the bulk of them in 2019, before, you know, at least in my life, Zoom had <laughs> caught on and sort of reinvented the, um, the, the online uh, webcam experience. And, you know, I really liked it that one thing that I try to do, you know, in, in, when, I, when I'm interviewing people is to create as informal, you know, a, an experience as I can, you know, and showing up, you know, in somebody's house or inviting them to a studio, you know, with a 12 person crew and lights and chairs and all that um, baggage that comes with making sure that the studio is perfectly quiet and cueing people to go can sometimes create a little bit of tension and that it take that it takes a while to to break through and you know a webcam has a really nice formality in a earlier film in 237 you know those those interviews were you know only done you know on the telephone i mailed people i sort of fedex them audio recorders that they could record their own voices um, as we talked but it was just a phone conversation and you know the other thing that that allows is we can talk for an hour, we can talk for two hours, we can talk for three hours, and we don't have to, you know, make sure that the grips, you know, keep themselves quiet and keep their phones off and aren't, you know, crunching into a bag of Cheetos too loudly. People also don't feel like, you know, they're being watched by, you know, the crew who are all gathered outside. So, um, you know, I really, I, 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 I in, in some ways, I prefer it. And, you know, I, I do have to say also that, you know, in the course of it, you know, I think in almost every conversation I had, when we would be talking about ideas of, you know, simulation and virtual reality and things that, you know, we would have to, even if the connection felt very, very real and very visceral, from time to time, we'd have to, I'd pull back and say, granted, you're experiencing me only in a, you know, 360 by, you know, 240 pixel window, and you'll assume that there's a real person on the other end of this. Right. But, you know, from your experience, it's not all that different from, you know, watching a YouTube video or or playing a game that, you know, this, you know, what we're doing here. Right. That we're experiencing each other, you know, strictly through, you know, a video window, of a, you know, a, a fairly limited amount of, you know, pixels and in, in sound data uh, moving back and forth, which was very on theme. Right. I kind of overthink things sometimes and I very much want the style of you know, all the projects that I work on to, you know, work hand in hand with, with the ideas that we're talking about. Exactly. And I very much appreciate your mentioning how virtual spaces in Zoom or Skype, I think I'm starting to use Zoom like the new version of Kleenex, but um, also in how it relates to the fact that having a virtual Q&A about your film is also very fitting for the style that it took place. And I'm wondering too, how you view the film in that format now post uh, 2020 and the forcing of people into their homes and onto their virtual screens. Do you feel that that's changed the meaning of the film for you at all or? Well, you know, certainly my experience has been, you know, this is the first time that I've, I've yet to see, you know, the finished film in a theater with an audience. You know, I've only done virtual Q and A's, and you know, our premiere. You know, we were lucky enough to be invited to Sundance, but it was a virtual Sundance, which meant everybody was watching, 
you know, at home. And, you know, a lot of folks, you know, mentioned to me that, you know, watching the movie on an iPad in bed in the dark was kind of really fitting experience, you know, for this film in particular. I mean, even at Sundance, they went so far as to have, I mean, one thing that that festival is known for is having really great parties. And they went out of their way to keep that rolling by doing parties in VR. Like they built a virtual space station. And when you put on the helmet and fired up the software, you were like this strange robotic, you know, avatar looking out the window of a space station down at the earth, chatting with people with tiny little video windows or thumbnails, you know, where their faces should be. You know, and when, you know, the cast and crew of our film got together to, to talk, you know, it couldn't have been, you know, a more perfect, you know, if in some ways terrifying um, way to do it. I mean, it was so on message with the theme of the movie. And in some ways it feels like maybe there was sort of a monkey's paw thing happening where by talking so much about virtual life and, you know, living through digital in, in digital media, we found ourselves, you know, we continue to find ourselves trapped in it, you know, in the aftermath of the movie. Monkey's paw or picking up on the vibrations of the simulation to lead us all to an interesting revelation uh, with your film. Um, one of the things I noticed speaking about that, picking up on the history of simulation and theory and who has been clued in or who has been thinking about this for a long time, you reference a lot of segments from Philip K. Dick's interview from 1974. Is that what inspired you to, to go down this rabbit hole or did that come up through research? No, that was something I found after research. But, you know, as I watched it, you know, moment after moment after moment, you know, just had this uncanny resonance, you know, with our own time and place. Like one thing that he talked a lot about, you know, was that the clue to the idea that we're living in a simulation would be memories of the past having, having changed. And, you know, when he was describing that, it was a very abstract idea. He had an example that in his house, he remembered, he reached for, I think, a pull chain to turn a bathroom light on and instead found a switch on the wall. You know, and it was certain that that light had a pull chain, but that someone had gone back in the past and changed, and, and changed the layout. And, you know, back in 1977, when he was talking about that, it was a completely new and bizarre idea. But, you know, today, you know, for years, people have been cataloging, you know, Mandela effects, which purport to talk about exactly the same phenomenon. I mean, there's that whole movie that they made about the guy who woke up and he was the only person who remembered, you know, the Beatles, which was like a Mandela effect feature film, a zillion dollar, you know, blockbuster based around that kind of idea. He also spoke in that speech and it was in an earlier cut, but, you know, eventually, you know, things had to go. He was talking a lot about the um, impeachment of Richard Nixon. And while we were, while I was working on that sequence, you know, it was sim happening simultaneously with the impeachment, you know, of Donald Trump. And the echo of that, you know, felt very eerie at the time. You know, like you, you work on a project like this and then, you know, every stray coincidence feels deeply, deeply meaningful. And there's sort of a clue that you're onto something. I definitely found myself finding instances in my own life after watching the film and speaking with you in prep for this session. I was like, oh, here's another yeah. evidence. Here's how it all fits in. Um, one quick question I do want to ask before we invite our other two panelists to join is you use a lot of uh, B-roll in your film, um, either through sections of other films or advertisements or other documentaries. Um, how did that figure into your thinking about copyright issues when making this film as a process? And, and what about fair use agreements for that? Well, as a librarian fascinated. Yeah, well, you know, when I was in film school, one of the, I think, more influential movies, you know, that I watched was Bruce Connor's A Movie, which is entirely, you know, collaged from pre-existing films, but also like, transformed radically. By you know, by what he cuts the shots into, and you know the relationship to one another, and looking at them twenty or thirty years after they were shot, and I did a lot of experiments playing around, you know, with a lot of, you know, with, 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 with a lot of archival footage and you know favorite songs from my record collection. So that's a style that I've always 
enjoyed working in and thinking about. And you know, when I did Room 237, which is a film about people obsessed with The Shining, you know, a huge amount of that movie, you know, is actually, you know, footage from Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. And in working with a legal team, you know, to um, get that stuff, um, to get to, to get that stuff legal to use in the film, you know, I really went to fair use boot camp. You know, fair use being the, um, um, you know, the aspect of copyright law that allows you to reuse copywritten um, footage depending on depending on how you use it, what you're, what you're saying, the context, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a style I've gotten used to working in. And, you know, this film in particular uses a lot of like 90s, you know, cyberpunk movies, but also a lot of video game footage and YouTube videos, which were different. Um, you know, and a lot of it was fair use, but like you go through it in the, in the course of making these sorts of films, like you make a, a spreadsheet that includes every shot in your movie and where it comes from and what you're trying to say with it and, you know, have these discussions with the clearance team. And, you know, there's a lot of fair use in the film, but there's also a fair amount of footage that we had to license, things that, you know, the clearance team said, I get why you're using it, but that doesn't count as fair use. And I mean, we could do a four hour fair use, you know, seminar here because, the rules of, of how it works are, um, you know, there's a fair amount of interpretation involved, but there's a lot, there's a lot of fair use in this movie, but there's some licensed stuff as well. You might regret mentioning having a four hour discussion. <laughs> I will call you for that. As a librarian, I find the idea of copyright, especially in a film space, very engaging. And actually this question was suggested by uh, Ralph Atuccio. So I'll actually invite Ralph and Kristen to hop on as well. So we can, have a more collaborative discussion. You can maybe ask some questions you have for Rodney directly. Um, so to welcome everyone to the question section together, I'm gonna shoot out a question to the group. One of the things that came up in the film was the idea that when everything is social, suddenly nothing is. And the belief that societies do not die because of a lack of communication, societies die because there is too much communication. What are all of your thoughts on that and how that relates maybe to either your work as a filmmaker or your work as an academic? Kristen, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, so, well, that's a great question because I think uh, communication is um, really at the core of what we're trying to do in architecture. And uh, for one of the things that I like to think about is what is the purpose of using these technologies and you know who is using it and what are the scales that people are using this for. Um, so one of the things that I've been doing recently is looking at how we take urban design and changes to cities and get input from citizens. And I think when we start to communicate design, um, it's very difficult to do that in you know, a plan you know, especially, you know, nobody can really read two, read two dimensional plans. How do we do that? Um, how do we start to look at that from an artistics perspective? And so one of the things that I really love about uh, my work at Carnegie Mellon is that it is very interdisciplinary. You know, we draw on the architectural design. Uh, we have, you know, faculty that are using these technologies to look at um, lighting, Azadeh Sawyer is using a course right now looking at lighting and the art and the science of lighting and how that's in spaces. Um, but I think we, I personally also draw a lot on the work that's being done with Ralph in the Entertainment Technology Center and the gaming aspects, and then also the uh, film aspects of how do we bring in uh, the detail and how do we communicate that. So I think that for me, um, communication is a big part of it. Um, but I also wanted to you know, take a step back and say within architecture, it's not just uh, you know, architectural spaces, it's really useful for, um, I, just, I just did a panel on uh, the modernization of ports and airports. And it's really useful for you know, sort of the reality of how are we using these technologies to maintain facilities? Um, the San Francisco airport just gave a really interesting example of a digital twin which is really important when we start to look at this in architecture and how do digital twins fit into um, building these technologies. And, and it was used for maintenance. You know, it might not be a glamorous thing, but that's an important thing for, our, for architecture. How do we go in and we take a look at the space uh, without having to be there? 
so I think it's, it's, um, you know, it's a really interesting area that we're in right now. And I'm looking at this from a lot of different perspectives in the field of architecture. Mm. Good. I'll take a, a darker side to that approach. <laughs> <laughs> approach. And um, I, I think, uh, Emma, the quote you, met, you mentioned uh, about all societies, uh, what is it, the societies, what was the quote? It was a, it was a um, with the more communication there is, uh, the, the worse sometimes it becomes, the more problems you have. And I think obviously that's an obvious problem right now with disinformation and Facebook and the internet. And um, I mean, there's a lot of good things about it, of course. And, and like, like, like Kristen said, the, the communication for, for improvement of society and is, is wonderful. But there's a lot of negative things to it. And I think that the quote was from Jean Boudrillard, a, a French philosopher and sociologist as well. Um, but, um, and he wrote a lot about simulation theory and simulacra and the simulation. In fact, the book, I think if you remember in the Matrix, right at the beginning of the Matrix, when Neo gets the chips and puts them, he'll, he gets a book, it's hollowed out where he puts his money and his chips in. And it's a book by Jean Boudrillard. It's like the simulacra simula uh, simulation book he puts the stuff in. And that was the whole sort of theory of that film based on you know, a lot of uh, Boudrillard's um, theories about simulation. But the communication thing, I think, is an interesting one because what happens, particularly in our society now, is that it, it, there's so much of it that it's, and you don't know what's real and what's truth and what's lies, what's fact. You, you just have no idea. So it, it becomes even, it becomes chaos, you know, it, uh, you know, the, the, the reality is sort of a thin layer of ice at, above this sort of mass source of information that is sometimes real, sometimes good, sometimes positive and constructive, and sometimes chaos and destructive. So that's a little bit more of a negative approach to it. And I'm not a negative guy, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that's, but it, it's, yeah, I see that side of it. Uh, but going back to my work, um, I, I'm really into the social, using VR and interactive documentary work and linear pieces for social issues, dealing with issues that deal with racism or other cultures or, um, you know, so I'm, I'm really into that. And, and, I, and I, believe, I believe the technology we have access to, VR, um, it can be used for, for those kind of purposes. Yeah, I mean, I think when I hear that quote, my head goes to a lot of the same places, you know, I think that Ralph's does. Um, you know, one phrase that, you know, comes back to me is, you know, as hard as it is to find a, a needle in a haystack, you know, what's much more difficult is to find a needle in a needle stack. <laughs> and, and remember, you know, in the 90s, watching the internet come together, I had, you know, the sort of completely wrong intuition that nobody was going to be able to get away with a lie anymore because everybody's going to get on their computer and fact check them and that would be the end of it but you know you go on you go on to any topic where there's a little bit of controversy and you know dispute on wikipedia and you say like i remember the day where you know i heard some plausible you know counter argument about climate change and i said well i'm going to get to the bottom of this right, like in an afternoon over coffee. And I went to the Wikipedia page, and of course it was 500 pages long and footnoted to a thousand places that would continue to open up and expand, you know, in the, um, in the, in the attempt to get my head around it would be never ending. Um, the other maybe aspect of it, you know, I, I'm not sure if this is what he was getting at, but, you know, when you say everything is social, um, you know, nothing is, like you see that, um, you know, that promotion for, you know, the metaverse that um, Zuckerberg just put out, you know, and it's like, okay, so this business meeting looks kind of like a video game. Well, it's, well, when everything looks like a game, you know, games aren't anything fun anymore. I know how um, disappointed I was as a kid. I went to speech therapy to get my R's um, um, sorted out. And like she gave me a list of activities to do the therapist that included, you know, you play tic-tac-toe and before you do each move, say one of these, you know, complicated words. And, you know, I was so insulted. I was like, look, we can, I'll, I'll put away some time and speak these words and do these exercises, but don't ruin 
the game for me by trying to make it fun. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I see gamification of work as something that people are trying to do. And, you know, I think it could be the worst of both worlds sometimes. You know, Emma, I just want to add that, you know, you asked an important question, I think, at the beginning and how as the pandemic changed, you know, the way that Rodney created the film and the way that, you know, Rodney, you explain how, um, you know, the Sundance and the interactions of the, you know, um, you know, the, the, the celebration of the film. You know, I think that this is really important because I think that this is really a great opportunity for us to be able to use these kinds of platforms. You know, go back to what I was just talking about with reaching citizens. Um, I think people have, um, you know, used, it used to be that if we wanted to have somebody, you know, uh, test a design, they would have to come to a place. And that wasn't, you wouldn't get general citizens doing that, coming to a critique. Whereas if we can do it in these environments now, we can start to use these technologies in different ways um, that people are much more, I think if you look at the average citizen, you know, they're much more comfortable in these environments now than they were in the past. Yeah, and then you can save the face-to-face -face in real life encounters for things that are actually really important. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it becomes absolutely. more like a boutique experience. Yeah, true. Um, and then there's always that yin yang. You know, there's always that light side and the dark side. There's always what can what what it can be used for 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 the good of society, and there's always what it can be used for for the opposite of that. And I again, I'm, I'm not a cynical person, so like, but I keep on sort of hitting that note, those chords. But um, but I'm aware of that all the time. That what appears to be good and is good can also be used for for as a with a, with bad actors as well. Sure. well but, yeah. I think in I think in academia um, we tend to focus on the good, and I think elsewhere, like the metaverse you talked about, Rodney. I think that is you know, and again, it was started out as like the same thing. You, what you said struck a chord with me. That you know, you hear information, and what do you do? You go straight to the internet to find out if it's true or not. If there's any yeah. truth. To it. Yeah, and I think what you're all talking about in terms of how we relate to virtual spaces, what we're trying to find from them, be it the internet or a VR experience, or I really appreciate what you're mentioning as well, Kristen, about community engagement and how we're connecting with each other as citizens and with our physical space around us, both physically and in VR. And uh, not to maybe ask you to do this too much, Ralph, to play the uh, devil's advocate antagonist here, but I'm really wondering too about how the focus on mental health that came in through the film, not only in terms of the actual crime that was committed, but in every person who was interviewed seemed to touch on at some point an issue involving mental health and how much the virtual space that we're becoming more accustomed with uh, is for the better or for worse affecting our engagement with each other and with ourselves as mental healthy individuals. Well, I can say, you know, briefly that, um, you know, the film does go to a lot of dark places, right? And there, and you see a fair amount of mental health crises within it, most most specifically, you know, within the story of Josh Cook, but some of the other um, participants, you know, are getting to you know, some fairly negative dark places too. But I do have to say that while, you know, finishing the film, you know, admits lockdown, I could tell what a panacea digital communication was for my son. I've got a 11 year old son, I guess he was 10 during the worst of it. And being able to stay connected to his friends, you know, while playing video games for him more, it was more network video games than zoom was the way that he would interact with people. But, you know, that really made a world of difference for him in an ice in our sort of isolated emergency lockdown. You know, I'm still trying to, pry him out of it, you know, now that we're looking at the other side of it. But, you know, um, you know, I have to admit that I saw, you know, the, the, the lighter side of things um, as well during that period. No, and I agree with that. I mean, and I don't want to always be on the dark side of it, but because when, it, when the, the pandemic first hit, and I'm sure Kristen went through the same issue, my whole class turned into a remote course. And I was like, oh, this is not going to be good. And I know a lot of people who it wasn't good for, but I was, I was ecstatic at how well it all worked. I thought, it, you know, we, and I had a class of, you know, 40 people, it wasn't huge, but it was amazing how well it worked. And, and I, I, I see a lot of, I see it, it could be used in, in a number of ways. And it was really, it was a really 
productive uh, class, even everything done on Zoom. And I had students working in different, all over the world, working on projects uh, that were, you know, interactive projects or, 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 or cooperative film projects. And it worked really, really well. I was surprised how well it worked. Hey, Emma, can I take it in another direction too about this? Because we're talking right now about, you know, Ralph just mentioned, you know, how well the Zoom environment worked. Um, I've been experiencing some other environments where it is more like an avatar um, environment. Um, you know, I was on a panel at Penn State had a panel for um, geo design and I was on the advisory panel. And for many years, we would actually attend these meetings um, in Penn State's, um, you know, building <laughs> that they had built a digital twin of. And I, I, it was the first time I experienced it as an avatar. And, you know, I think there is a big difference here between just being boxes on the screen versus, you know, what you were getting at, Rodney, um, you know, being there in that environment. Now, I didn't have to have a headset on or anything like that in this environment, but I really felt like I was sitting at the table, you know, with the other participants. And I could, we broke, when we broke into breakout rooms, we actually physically went to separate rooms. And it was, you know, mimicking the actual architecture that was there where we would normally have driven to go there or flown in to go there. So I think that when we start to look at teaching um, and they were teaching in the studio environment with these avatar type, um, you know, applications, they've been teaching online for many years. But I think that when we start to look at that immersive experience, um, it, it does, it is going to hopefully in the future go well beyond just the boxes that we're seeing here on these screens. And I think Rodney's really starting to get at that with what he was, you know, um, doing in his film. And I, it's very exciting for me to see that in the realm of education. No, that, yeah. that is, that is, a, that's happening a lot, Kristen. It, it really is. It's going to, it's going to get better and better now. With, you well, could be, you know, yeah, I, I, I participated, I did an event, sort of a Q and A within um, Altspace VR. You know, and they had built a, they had built out sort of a, it looked like a music venue, like a bar, you know, with a stage and you know, there about 50 people in the audience and me and the moderator, you know, on the stage. And it was a very, very convincing, mm -hmm. you know, sort of environment and one that, you know, immersion, I guess, can be sort of an overused word in these kind of things, but very effectively immersive, very much felt like I was in the room with these folks and, you know, I've likewise, there's a, a program called Spatial. There are other versions of it where, you know, I wanted to work on a, a project, a writing project with a friend in Atlanta. And the two of us put on our Oculuses, Oculi, and, you know, met in this room, you know, for an hour or so every week. And what was cool is we could throw our, um, our post-it notes up on the wall and they would be there when we went back next, the, the, the week after. You know, so we were able to sort of create this messy three-dimensional workspace and then revisit it again and again and again, you know, and, and, and change it and update it, you know, in a way that, you know, living hot, living on the other side of the country, you know, the only other real alternatives were phone or, um, you know, phone or Zoom. And this felt, you know, much more like, okay, the two of us are hunkered down in a place together. Um, very much, and, and that actually makes me think of a question for Kristen based on what you had talked about earlier in terms of the future of architecture and how we're constructing spaces virtually. What do you see as the potential for changing how we as people view space and place with the introduction of AR or VR skills? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that um, I'm gonna go back to, again, some of the work that some of my colleagues are doing. Um, you know, Azade Sawyer, I mentioned, uh, her course is, um, you know, shaping light through simulation and, and virtual reality. And, you know, when we talk about this, um, and, I, and I do a lot of this, not just with the research of this and, and how we're using virtual and augmented reality in our own design, but again, how do we communicate it? Um, you know, and I think that it, for me, it's exciting because it is, one of the only ways to truly feel immersive and to truly test it. Um, you know, how are we gonna truly test how we're experiencing this? And whether it's just with research and figuring out how that lighting should work from the, the, the designer's perspective, but how do you feel? How do, how do the people feel about this? Which really is an art and a science. And so I think that these technologies 
Uh, we're, we're on the cusp now of really making them truly integrated in our research. And I think, you know, Rodney and Ralph might know a little bit more about, you know, the hardware around it, you know, and how all of that works. And, you know, Rodney and I, we were talking earlier, you know, that hardware is, um, you know, more commonplace. And I was, you know, I made the comment, oh, my father, you know, is in a nursing home. I don't see him putting it on this. But Rodney said, oh, no, my mother was able to do this and play ping pong. And so I think that, you know, a lot of it is both how we're using the tools to design, but how we're using them to, again, communicate to people. Yeah, I agree. And particularly with VR, I mean, the, some of the early practitioners of VR were referred to as an empathy machine. People like Nani de la Pena and Chris Milk we're doing a lot of work in VR and they were they 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 talk about it as if it create it can create empathy and this is one way they it can be used to reach people to help people understand you know situations to help them whether they're they you know some people are using VR for burn patients to put them in a a cold environment a, a Antarctica so they're where there's snow coming down so it was in, in, in so many other applications. We just did one, um, some students of ours just did one with uh, training doctors how to deal with, talk to patients. And I was just sat in a VR uh, exp uh, prototype yesterday where you have a patient and it was voice activation, it was voice recognition. So you could talk to this person and this person answers you. I mean, it was a prototype, so there was a lot of issues about it. But the idea of it, and as the technology gets better and the computing power gets better, this is, yeah. This is gonna, it's, it's pretty incredible what it's gonna be able to do. Yeah, I saw a um, VR clip. I actually use a short clip of it in the movie, it goes by pretty quickly, where they're using a, a VR simulator to teach middle managers how to fire people. <laughs> <laughs> there was an animated character who would say, I put my best years in this company. And then you had to find a way to <laughs> talk him down. And of course, Ooh, yeah. The terrifying flip side of that is, you know, going into what was when you take the step into simulation theory and say, oh, was that why I was created to train somebody out there mm -hmm. how to do, how to fire me, how to do, how, how to do this or that? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Kind of reminds me of the film Up in the Air, where the premise is sending people around the country to fire people. At the end of the film, the new solution is we're not gonna fly you anywhere anymore. You're gonna be firing people virtually through a computer. <laughs> and so this is an interesting like resonance of that conversation as well. I do wanna invite the audience, if you do have any questions that you have either from watching um, The Glitch in the Matrix or from coming up through the discussion we've been just having, please do feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, I'm gonna pass it over actually based on what we've just been talking after that reminder to Ralph um, so you're talking about your experience creating content for VR, creating, in some cases, also your work as a VR designer in film. Um, how has that shaped your belief in sh simulation theory? And do you believe the theory is plausible? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, I, I think it, when I think about simulation theory and I listen to people like Elon Musk and uh, Neil Tyson, you know, Neil like, deGrasse Tyson, talking about, well, Dick Tyson says it's a 50-50 chance, and, but Elon Musk believes it's 100% there. Uh, I don't know, it, to me, to me, what's that, what's He's that, Rod? A billion to one. A billion to one. <laughs> to me though, I, and I have to, I, and I'm totally honest with you, to me, it's, it smacks of religion. And I grew up in a Catholic, uh, you know, house, and I, I'm not, I don't, I don't follow religion anymore, but it was like, it's like, it's like a religious kind of belief, you know, and you ha and that's the key word, belief. You have to have belief in it in order to buy into it 100%. And I don't necessarily have all that much belief in it. It's like mixing science with religion, which I don't think is always, it never turns out to be a good thing. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm a very suspect of it. I mean, if you believe it, I mean, look at QAnon. In a, in a way, that's kind of a simulation. People, you know, being in a simulation, sort of, they they believe in it 100% conspiracy theories. They believe in it in the 100%. They are, you know, in a way, in a simulation. You're in a theistic religion is sort of, a, in, in a way, a simulated environment to believe everything out there is, is concerns, you know, this certain type of God or belief system. And I don't, I don't necessarily... I find it too much like religion. Yeah, well, religious questions came up really quickly in the course of 
the movie and most everybody I talked to in a way that surprised me going in. Like I didn't expect so many religious themes to kind of grow out of it. But, you know, I kept seeing parallels to, you know, gods assuming human form to come down into the world or imagine, imagining, you know, the notion of um, like who created the universe and what for, that they all had you know, really, really striking religious um, elements. I know, you know, at a certain point in the movie, I was trying to find, I had read about these, um, this video game that was designed that allows you to explore, you know, countless planets and each planet had flora and fauna. And because so much of that stuff had to be created, it wasn't created one at a time, you know, by hand, but they had to find an algorithm that would allow plants and animals and things to grow naturally on this planet, on, on each of these digital planets. And there was an article I read that they couldn't find the right algorithm until they came across one reprinted in Nature magazine about how trees grow, right? And how, how they, you know, how the branches expand and split and leaves come and, you know, it's all kind of fractal and repeats at different scales. And I could just imagine one of those game designers after, you know, watching, you know, their plants grow, you know, on planet 10 and in, in, in whatever galaxy they were working on, going on a hike in seeing that same pattern, you know, replicated in nature and how that would, how that would strike them. Interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. I noticed that in the film too, though, it, it, the religion was always, there was this sort of, you know, it was always people were ready to talk about it. It was this undercurrent of that going on. Yeah. Yeah. One of them wanted to build a tower of Babel so that they could, right. so that they could reach out into the heavens and communicate, send a message to their creators. You know, yeah, what are the I other interesting thing? I'm sorry, Emma, you have a, you're going to ask. What are the other interesting things about the film, Rodney, was the one person who talked about um, people do not have original thoughts anymore. Yeah. I thought that was really, that struck me. That mm -hmm. really resonated with me because I think that sometimes too. I think it's the more I read, the more I watch, the more I do this, the more of that. And I have an idea and I go, you know, I think, is that idea coming from me? Is it an original idea or am I remediating it somehow? Or am I remixing it somehow, rehashing it? And I, I thought that was a really interesting comment that he, and, that, and an insight that he had. Yeah, well, I mean, I spend way too much time on Twitter. And, you know, whenever I find myself about to embark on a political argument, it's depressing because I can see every argument and counter argument up and down like five or 10 steps. Now, knowing that none of them even came from me originally, but that I would pick the role that seemed to feel right based on my gut. But, you know, it's it wasn't my doing the reasoning. It was me repeating arguments that I've, that, that, that I've seen out uh, litigated, you know, but just in text too, right? On Twitter is yeah. very simple, um, you know, character-based text, but those ideas, you know, sink into your head and those are the moves to make in you know, sort of the chess game of a, you know, political, uh, political argument you might have. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And I remember that to, to religion and to how we behave in our systems, we're all byproducts of the social environment that we have been raised in. And seeing those same kind of processes of thought applied to something like simulation theory makes perfect sense to me. And I think what shocks me the most uh, about the film is when people were talking about non-player characters. So how we view people who are outside of the belief of simulation. Um, and how close that's resonated to me with other groups that also deal with exclusion or, you know, how do we determine one from the other? And on that very positive note, <laughs> I'm going to transition into uh, questions from the audience because there is actually questions from the audience that does fit very closely with this. And it's, does the golden rule, um, the rule where you treat others as you would like to be treated, um, still hold true in a world where a simulation exists, thinking about others as non-player characters and how we deal with the believers in simulation versus the non-believers in simulation. Sure, there's an algorithm for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big question and there's no reason to necessarily think that I've got the best answer, but I remember having a conversation with this about, uh, you know, on this topic with someone else and it was a, he had a really interesting way of putting it, which was, you know, 
the simulation theory makes raises the big question of are you the, is this a solipsistic world where you're the only person or is everybody you know in a pod like Neo like you is is everybody as real as you are or are you or, or are you different and he brought up Pascal's wager as a way of saying since it's almost impossible to tell the safer bet is to treat everybody as if they are a real fully human person <laughs> like you like like you are that there's um that that's a, that's a fairly low risk thing that you can do with a very high, with a very high reward and, and yet i would think the same might apply to climate change and we don't as a society really go treating the planet how it should be treated to keep it alive even if it is a simulation uh, another question from the audience that connects exactly to this same question is if the world goes more towards um VR or these more virtual spaces, will there will we slide as a society into an only I matter philosophy or a rise of solipsism? So just exactly what you're talking about, um, but more perspective not only from simulation theory but also from just being in virtual spaces where we can connect with one another but not in the same space as one another. I'm I'm just going to say a little bit from my experience um, that. In a way, I have the opposite when we're in these virtual um, worlds. I've been teaching online at Carnegie Mellon now since 1999. And, you know, a lot of times people would say to me, you know, isn't it so isolated that you're teaching in that that world? Um, but I got to know the students a lot better in this in this environment um, for, for, for a long time. But I think it's the way you structure your interactions. Um, you know, I would purposely ask everybody to make a homepage wiki so I knew about everybody personally. Um, you know, I think there's ways that you have to engage. So I think that, you know, it's it's about, again, how we communicate and engage. And I don't know if the technology and maybe Ralph and, and Rodney have more thoughts about the actual VR technology and how you do that. But I think it's still human behavior. I agree with you, Kristen. In fact, uh, to that point, uh, one of the things I was doing in one of my classes that I was all totally online and it only had 12 people in. So a class larger than that would be hard to do. And I know my co-instructor was getting fed up with me because I was taking too much time going individually to each person and saying, Emma, how are you today? How's everything? How are you feeling? Uh, Rodney, what was your day like? Did you see any good movies recently? You know, and I would go down everybody and personalize it and um, ask, you know, try to be a little bit more, you know, just, you know, touching base with them on a human level. And I think that helped quite a bit. And I think it addresses exactly what you're, you know, you were talking about. And I found that, I found the students to be really appreciative of that. Well, you know, and I might just add that the problem of getting, of having everyone treat each other decently predate simulation theory by several thousand years. Uh, simulation theory is not necessarily the only philosophy in which you divide people into more and less valuable groups. Um, but as these guys are saying, there are you know, amazing things about digital tools that do allow us to you know, get to know each other um, a little better, a little deeper. Um, you know, I was struck in, um, in the film talking to Emily Pottis, who was talking about how human touch in some ways can be the antidote to you know solipsism, whether you're, you know, and whether you're talking about something well erotic or even if it's just a slap on the shoulder or you know a game of you, you know or a game of tag, you know what have you that that can go that that can go a long way into proving the the realness of of, of each other. I really love your point there. Something I noticed uh, isolated on my own in an apartment during COVID was that human touch was something that I would have craved more than anything else, probably having just engaged with these screens for so long. And part of that, I think, too, relates to exactly what Kristen and Ralph you're talking about in terms of the intentionality that we have to have in virtual spaces to be socially connected and inclusive. Um, and, and thinking of that in mind, do we have any thoughts on how virtual reality can lead to greater inclusion spaces, um, not only for people who might be divided by physical space, but also for people who are physically disabled or who have other accessibility challenges? 
Uh, absolutely, I think so. I think Kristen mentioned a, 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 when she a, the Penn State example, where she was visiting, you know, re, you know, virtually uh, with groups of people around in in, in a table. With uh, Kristen, were you in a headset? Was it a VR thing? Were you? No, using- no, was it was. Headset? Yeah, it was just uh, you know in this space and. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Now I can't remember how, how did I feel like I was there? It was somehow the technology and I don't know the tools that they used, but I felt like I could see, I, as I was looking in my computer, I was feeling like I was, you know, looking at the other person in that space. But I think you're right though. And, you know, when you look at, um, disabilities, you know, people with disabilities and having them be able to, um, participate in a way that they couldn't before. And I think that we're going to look at a lot of blended modes, where, you know, I was just in a review yesterday with a group of students where they were presenting live on campus, but we had participants that were on Zoom. And so, you know, if somebody does have some type of a disability that they cannot get to the place, they can in another way. Um, I just want to mention one other thing. I think that it also, people's personalities come out differently. I see that students in a virtual environment, in some cases, are much more communicative than they were in a classroom. Um, You know, some students may sit in the back of the classroom and not talk ever, and I would get to know them much better in a virtual environment. So, you know, I don't know how, you know, avatars will fit into that, Rodney, but, you know, if you're not yourself, you know, you're a different being, how does that pull out? And, you know, for all, you know, let's say that the four of us were all just, you know, our avatar people, how will that communicate differently? Well, I mean, I think, one thing that when I did that VR, that alt VR thing, you know, I, I designed an avatar who was sort of like a blue elf in a cowboy hat. And then I was sort of surprised that most of the other people that I, that I knew there were more or less cartoon versions of themselves. And I was the one who created a fantastical character, but I mean, it really made me think about comparing avatars to just the way that, you know, people present in real life, you know, that, no matter how, how interested in fashion you are, you're still making, most people still make very active choices about their hairstyle, the clothes they wear, right? That you're still designing your avatar, um, even if you're trying to make it look like you didn't put any effort into it, you know, that all, that all, that all communicates, you know, a little bit as well. Hey, Rodney, I have a question for you. Um, it just came up. I just thought sure. about this. the pe- some of the people in your video, in your film, why were they? Why were they wearing masks? Why? What? Why would they not reveal themselves as people? Was there? Was there a reason they had for that? Um, was that your decision or their decision? That was my decision, it, and that came really early on. And it was sort of a playing with the idea of avatars, and of playing the idea that, you know, as we communicate these days, you know, like, you know, I spend a lot of, I, I probably spend more time texting with people than I do. Um, actually talking with them on the phone. And, you know, we all have different images that we're speaking with of, of, you know, thumbnails that we're all getting very used to communicating, you know, via some kind of an avatar, whether it's, you know, even an image of us or our favorite anime character or, you know, um, you know, or of a movie star. So we were kind of playing with those notions in my imagining sort of a near future where, avatars are increasingly common. I mean, I was, I was struck in that video that um, Zuckerberg made about the um, metaverse. And I hadn't even really thought about that, but he went and he, he, there was like three or four of his buddies around a table and some of them were human and some of them weren't. And at a certain point he mentioned, you know, that we'll have multiple avatars that, you know, there's the business avatar, you know, with the, your professional avatar, which is a very, you know, serious, low-key looking character. And then you might have your video game avatar who is a more fantastical one versus your personal one for your friends. Um, I would kind of suspect that you'll be using that same one for most of them, um, you know, in that your boardroom meeting, you know, we'll have robots and Smurfs, um, you know, sitting at opposite sides of the table. You know, so it's all, it was all sort of playing with those ideas. And you know, as a, each of these projects that I do, you know, I kind of hyper focus again on doing them in a style that has, says something about the subject. And, you know, at a certain point, there was something fun about the idea that, well, in a way, these are kind of like video game characters on their day off. You know, like when you see that cartoon with um, 
the coyote and the sheepdog. It's a Warner Brothers cartoon where they're fighting and chasing each other off cliffs, but then the whistle blows and they go into the break room and they are still those characters, but they're having this very mundane conversation about their family and the holiday and upcoming holidays. But I love seeing those sorts of broad characters in mundane situations. Um, then the other practical thing it gave us was the ability to do those dramatic reenactment scenes you know, with the same character who was in the interview, right? And actually to put them into a world where they made more sense than in the um, you know, Skype backdrop of the, um, of the spaces they were actually in. Kind of in some ways making them appear to be in, a, they are in a simulation to us as an audience, but also possibly in a simulation in actuality. Yeah, well, um, one of the things, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say one of the other things that I wonder if we're allowed to choose our own avatars and meetings, am I ever going to show up at a meeting with five people dressed as Brad Pitt um, <laughs> and how copyright and licensing is going to work to that effect as well. Yeah, well, um, no, well that's going to happen in cloning. That's going to happen in cloning too when, you know, you can decide whether to um, have a custom, to make a custom baby or to choose one of the more popular models. <laughs> um, but, but thinking about you know licensing and, and how we deal with image creation, especially in, in your work, Rodney, um, for using other people's uh, content as a way to further your own. Um, we had a question from the audience that said the idea of fair use as a factor in style um, is interesting. Could you speak more about that? Are there things that you've skipped, including in your work because of legal obstacles, even when you felt that it was an important idea or insight that you would want to express but for simplicity's sake you just had to give it up i remember a couple things that i had to fight fairly hard for i don't know that i ever lost a shot that i really really wanted you know like one example and this one's very much about avatars and i had to do you know i, I had to have a a fairly elaborate conversation with the lawyers to get away with this but there was one of our guys jesse was imagining our world in a way in which highly achieving people are probably being played by real people outside the simulation, right? While some of us loser schlubs are, you know, just <laughs> NPCs. And he threw out the example of Kanye West and um, Michael Phelps. Um, and to illustrate that idea, you know, I found a, a video game clip of like these two, uh, it was like pr the predator versus like some ninja in Mortal Kombat. And, you know, I, what I like doing the most, sometimes when you're using archival material, it can be a very literal expression of what's being talked about. You know, in 19, you know, in, in 1944, you know, the allies invaded here, here, and then you have footage of, of that stuff. But, you know, when I can show something apart from what people are talking about and force the audience to see the connection, right? And to see Kanye West as a highly desirable video game character for the players to assume the same way the Predator might be. Um, you know, I think that that's more fun and more interesting. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I will say one quick thing and I, I was totally the movie with all the B-roll footage, it, it was like this incredibly intricate, complex puzzle to, because as a filmmaker, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, going through all that footage, trying to source it and find it and put it into perspective mm -hmm. and juxtapose the right things together. I'm like, whoa. So I, you know, it was a really, it was a really, it was, it was, it was a really nice piece of work and it was a lot of work. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And I think, as was discussed um, by one of the through lines in the film, having connections to pop culture definitely makes things more real for the audience, um, especially in terms of if we think about science fiction and the lead to technology, you know, how much is the matrix expressing what possibly already exists or what might exist one day? So even if a simulation isn't happening now, we could create one in the future. And, and speaking about like the future of VR, um, what are some opportunities that you see using this new technology <laughs> and quotations, um, things that we might appreciate now that we could build on or what's gonna become a new frontier for 
the increasingly digital world over the next 10 years? Well, we're heading there for sure. I mean, and the, the fact, you know, I was just looking at, uh, you know, the history of Carnegie Mellon and the School of Architecture, computational design is at the forefront. And, you know, we're talking now about representation. And, you know, in the architecture, we still have hand drawing, it's very tactile. Um, you know, so we, we go from hand drawing to augmented and virtual reality to represent, you know, spaces and atmospheres. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we're embracing is all of these ways to understand and design and understand and communicate. And I'm very excited about it, um, I, only because I've seen, um, you know, how this is reaching other people and having have them experience what they're going to be seeing or what they're going to be living in. Um, as well as the practical things, you know, like, you know, um, Ralph mentioned, you know, safety aspects. Um, at Carnegie Mellon, we were looking at simulating uh, safety and fire drills, you know, before you come to a situation of, um, you know, trying to make decisions, because this is in an extreme situation, we're using these tools to simulate what will happen. So you're prepared, whether it be for an interview or exiting a fire you know, situation. Um, there's just so many possibilities for it. But I'm also really excited and Rodney, especially you know, the film really hit home with me um, with how we're experiencing this, not just in a virtual reality, but how do we have these characters and how are we experiencing all of this, which I think is very important as well. Yeah, and the military is uses, you know, using a lot of VR and AR for, um, you know, in, in combat situations and also for training as well. Mm -hmm. um, but in my cases, with my, my VR pieces, I've worked on it. Again, everything is for some sort of social aspect to teach. I'm working on one right now on using VR for Asian hate crimes. And we're, we're interviewing a person and who, who documented with her cell phone someone who kind of accosted her verbally because she was Asian American. And we're gonna use that footage and turn it in VR, turn it into a volumetric representation of the person. So when you put that headset on, you can walk in her shoes, you could be there. And as this person gets closer to your face and starts you know, getting meaner and angrier and you, know, uh, you feel that. But then again, you know, there's some people who do not feel, won't, will not feel that empathy. And um, so, uh, and, and I just had an interview, a discussion, a meeting yesterday with a person about using VR to possibly look at racism and biases, but use it, use, think of it as, as a way of um, how you could create deep reflections in, in people to, to, so they see their own biases which is sort of, you know, it's kind of a difficult thing to think about, but I think VR can be used in that, in that way, as opposed to dealing with racism, like hitting it right in and punching it right in the nose with, you know, very obvious um, um, replications in VR, but look, using VR for people to, to have these sort of, sort of deeper, sort of creating deeper reflections in their own sort of psyches and what's below the surface, as opposed to what we, what we just see or what we just know about something. Yeah, and I remember earlier in the conversation, the term empathy engine came up, I, I think from your health. And I'm wondering how effective are VR experiences empathy engines? They can be, and when they first came out, people loved them. But, you know, like I mentioned, Chris Milk, yeah, I think he coined the phrase as, uh, you know, an empathy machine. Um, but, you know, there's been a, a lot of people writing about it after that saying, yeah, maybe not. It's not such an empathy machine. But, you know, it all depends on a person. I'll tell you two examples real quick. And I'll let Rodney, I'm sure he has a, a, an opinion about this. Um, we, some of my students, a student of mine seven, eight years ago did a VR piece on um, racial profiling. And it was called Injustice. And, and I work with the fellow, Jay, he and I now are doing the one on Asian hate crime. Anyway, so um, we, we put a lot of people through it and people were, people really were moved by it, really moved. And then I, I showed it to a couple other people and there was a couple people, you know, after you get out of it, you ask questions and I went, eh, 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 that's all right, that's all right. So, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not a magic bullet, you know, everyone's different how they, how they allow themselves to feel empathy and it's yeah so you never know but you try your best and for you Rodney have you seen um any indication of where your filmmaking might go 
in the future now with these new changes in VR and AR possibilities? Yeah, well, you know, in, in a way, I feel like it's connected to a lot of the stuff that I've been trying to do that these last couple of film projects, you know, I mean, there is maybe a, not a, the most straightforward, you know, way to do a documentary, but they're all to me about trying to, as Ralph was talking about, put the audience into the heads of, um, of the people that we're talking to, right? If, you know, room 237 it was about, you know, how do these different people, you know, wrestle with this one really complicated piece of art. In this case, you know, The Shining, the notion was let's get, let's try to get the audience to see that film the way each of those people see it. And in, you know, The Nightmare, we were talking to people who have, you know, this, who, you know, who suffer from sleep paralysis and in that state of consciousness, see these sort of ghostly figures. And rather than talking to psychologists and sleep experts, you know, and, and neurologists, you know, about REM sleep and, you know, where hallucinations come from. It was all very much about, let's just talk to people who go through this and try to understand both what their experience is like and literally what they see, right? And Glitch in the Matrix, you know, for me is very much trying to do, you know, a similar thing. And, you know, there's that sequence towards the end, you know, the kind of really, that, that really heavy sequence where Joshua Cook is walking through his house and we built a 3D model, you know, of this space. And, you know, that would have translated really well to VR because it was about creating a 3D space and moving the audience through it. In fact, when we were filming it, and it was a complicated process called photogrammetry. So what we did was we, um, Dress based on his descriptions and the information we could get about his house, we dressed a house to look like his would have back in 2003. In fact, we had to get two houses because a basement was an important part of the story. And in Los Angeles, um, basements are kind of hard to come by. So we found one house that had to be the basement and the other that had the bedrooms in the right place. And how photogrammetry works is you move through the space twice with all these long, you know, kind of um, tripods, one of them has sort of this machine that measures the, that shoots lasers out everywhere and measures the three-dimensional space. And the other one had like three or four um, cameras that would take photographs from every angle and they would move through like a grid. And then somehow some people much smarter than me were able to take the data from the laser machine and create a three-dimensional model of the space and then map the um, photographs over over that map and photographs onto the 3D map, and then we could move a 3D virtual camera through the space. And in order to tell the animators how this was going to, how this, how I wanted this to play, what I did was I listened to the interview on headphones while I walked through the house with a camcorder. And you know that was a, one of the more eerie and disturbing experiences I've ever had, like doing that walkthrough. But then when we were able to animate it, it was very much like that experience, you know, come to life, you know, that. Um, so, you know, I would love to be able to, to, to move into a VR project, which is about, you know, almost, uh, which, which would be about visualizing, you know, one or more people's highly subjective, highly personal experiences you know, I think it's a, like a lot like, you know, what, 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 what Ralph does and put the audience into, in, into that person's place, only, you know, that much more, um, you know, uh, immersively. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many times we've said immersion in the course of this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> yeah, it comes to the territory, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I, th I think you're really on to something because there's so many times with empathy, people can't put themselves in that situation. Right. And, you know, I've seen this in healthcare, um, you know, put yourself in a, a position where you can't move, you know, and how do you experience that? And, you know, these kinds of technologies, Rodney, will allow people to, you know, for, for all different reasons, you know, and exactly what you're doing, Ralph, in healthcare, um, you know, allow people to really experience what the other is experiencing. Yeah, Allegheny General Hospital worked with us a couple of years ago, very much a similar thing for nurses to teach nurses to be more empathetic to, to patients. 
and it was a it was a it, it was done in VR. You put the headset on. You don't see you didn't in that situation. You didn't see real characters. You saw graphic representations, avatars, and and the question with that though is whether it's more believable and more more empathy. You get you you feel more empathy if it's a real person as opposed to an avatar, which I don't know the answer to that question. But it's a good question. I kind of suspect the avatars might work better. That um, I know I read a I, I saw this great article about a police station that hired sort of a carnival caricaturist um, as opposed to the regular police, um, you know, um, car, um, sketch artist yeah. to you know take to take people's descriptions and the um, more cartoonish um, caricature was a hundred times easier to recognize. The, per, the the suspect from then the you know rather the when, when they're the too dry the too specific yeah right? yeah, but, yeah um, you're right Roddy Scott McCloud in his, mm -hmm. as a cartoonist he has a book and he talks about that very thing the yeah yeah I know the book how you put into a face the less people will relate to it right, well, it. yeah it's or part. it's only that one bad nurse instead of nurses <laughs> right to be represented by, right, right. by an avatar um, yeah, and I think too, um, just having the idea that if you have something that's not fully represented as a what we would normally conceive of as a human space, we can might relate to it more because we can find in that virtual representation in that avatar something that is pleasing to us as individuals that helps us connect with that object. But that's that's a real anthropological. I mean, thought. if you're familiar with the Kuleshov effect, right? The yeah. an experimental filmmaker who had an actor you know, perform, who filmed, a, a, you know, a scene of an actor with a, with a completely blank face and edited into multiple scenarios, each of which the audience felt a lot of investment in, whether he was looking at a lover or a bowl of soup, you know, or a coffin that, um, you know, you're projecting onto that blank canvas. Um, you know, it's a principle that, you know, I think has been repeated, you know, a, a, you know, a hundred times. 100,000 yeah. times. Yeah, Emma, I know you need to wrap up soon, but I just real quick, Rodney, can you tell sure. us some things you're working on? Because I mean, you're, this is, uh, you know, this, this, this film, this, this, you know, meeting was about you and your film. And I, it's, it's spurred so many interesting things that I can see. Oh, thanks. Um, what well, was nothing I'm quite ready to announce, but they're all projects that are moving in the same, that, that, that are moving in the same, you know, sort of category. And, the one that seems about closest to jump into, you know, is one person's story, which makes it different from, from, from some of these others. And it's, you know, somebody who was sort of suffering from delusions, but then they, in some ways, they sort of strangely came true. And a flip side of it was that, you know, when you look at this complicated story, he wasn't the only person who was not seeing reality, you know, um, as it was, you know, it was like there were multiple parties, you know, involved in this, you know, strange and, you know, kind of frightening event. And, you know, the guy suffering from a manic episode was not the only person who was failing to perceive reality exactly as it was, if that's not too vague to talk about, but it's very much about, you know, sub subjective perceptions, you know, from multiple multiple characters experiencing the same the, the same event you know in, in radically different ways and trying to get the audience to see it that to you know to to see it through each of their eyes which i think relates very well to also thinking about human experience in vr we're all experiencing the same virtual space mm -hmm. in different ways and um kristen beat me to my last question oh, sorry <laughs> so, <laughs> no it's great <laughs> I'm, I'm really appreciative of all three of you for the wonderful discussion that we've all been able to have today. Thank you to the audience as well for coming up with some really interesting questions for us to discuss. I know that I'm excited to see um, what Kristen and Ralph continue to do in VR at CMU and watching Rodney's next film, as well as uh, evangelizing for Glitch in the Matrix with everyone I've talked to this past week. I think they're tired of hearing me talk about it, but it's such a good film. I hope everyone yeah. who's been part of the call has a chance to watch it as well. Um, and with that, I think that we can uh, say goodbye. Thank you. And thank you, Rodney, for all your work and, and Ralph too.
Thank you. Great talking with you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for including including me, and it was great to be with you.